Thank you. Sie haben mich angegriffen, dort jenseits des Meeres. Und, und auf einer Bühne, wie, wie, wie dieser, nichts fand von hier. Keine Grenzen, äh, keine Grenzen kennen. Schreien Sie nach Ihnen. Gern sehen sich eine. Alles andere aus. Ihre Parolen und Pfannen bei uns daheim und hier bei euch gleichen sich aufs Haar, das noch anders getrunken wird. Gentlichen Sie, Sie aufs Haar, das nie andere getragen wird. Unser Millionenfach, unser unser Millionenfach. Millionenfach. Vergossenes, Blut. vergossenes Blut des Frühlings, des Frühlings. Euer, vergossenes Blut. euer vergossenes Blut vom Bataclan, vom Bataclan. Das, Kunstblut. das Kunstblut im Theater, Im Theater. Im Theater. versickert. In unseren, Tränen. In unseren Tränen. Wir sind, wir sind die, die uns jagen. Dort wir hier. Wir greifen uns an. Sind, sind es dieselben Männer, die aus der Heimat uns fol folgen? Wie Schatten. Oder fanden Sie schon immer hier? Wir wissen es nicht und fragen euch. Wir sind diese grauen Männer, die uns befassen und uns spalten. Aus Fächern, Heimat, Kohen, Sie. Aus welche Heimat kommen Sie? Und wer vermochten Sie zu halten, zu behügen in der Nacht? Dass Sie wieder eine Farbe werden, in der Erde abbild, Farben bracht. Und wer? Und, Und wer? Vermöchte, Vermöchte, sie zu halten, sie zu, zu, halten, zu, beruhigen, zu beruhigen in der Nacht, in der Nacht, Nacht dass, sie wieder, dass sie wieder eine Farbe werden, eine eine Farbe werden, werden in der Erde, in der Erde Abbild, Abbild, Farbenpracht. Farbenpracht. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank.
<coughs> thank you very much um, for this quite impressive performance, and thank all of you for being part of this event tonight here here at VEGX. Um, and welcome back to the second part of our DM presentation here here tonight. Um, before we go to the next discussion rounds, um, I would like to say a few words on the performance we just saw, or at least as far as I know, or what I know actually on this performance. Um, um, uh, what you just saw is actually only a part of a performance that is based on the play the Suppliance by Elfriede Jelinek, um, staged by the group Schweigende Mehrheit, um, silent majority, um, to be roughly tr translated. And it was written um, under the impressions of events that took place in 2013, as far as I know, right? In um, Here in Vienna, um, when people fleeing from other countries occupied a church in the very center of the city and stayed there for some weeks and Elfried Jelinek took this as the occasion um, to write this play. This play again is based on um, the suppliance by um, the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus and um, yeah, it's interesting that Already Aeschylus dealt with the issue of flight and with the rights, or actually more precisely, the denial of rights that people experienced that were forced to flee from their homelands. Um, however, Schweigen der Mehrheit started uh, with this work only um, in 2015, so last year, right? Yes, uh, um, we started and when, when Treiskirchen, uh, in the summer when Treiskirchen oh, was yes. so full. We started as an artist collective to uh, protest in, in, the first, uh, in the first part and then we uh, drove to Dreiskirchen and found these beautiful people there and uh, we founded a theater group so and now we're working and uh, not only playing theater with, with our guys, uh, helping them uh, searching for flats so some, when somebody has a flat or a room please contact us uh, and help them in the first interviews and what we can because we don't think that only theater can change something so we try to to mix uh, artist movement with a social mo movement. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much so far. I think that's um, so far. Um, thank you very much again. And um, yeah, uh, let's go to the next discussion rounds. Thank you. By the way, by the way, by the way, I am Lukas Franke, and um, I'm a curator here here at Work X, and I'm doing the second round together with Dani Pletsch. Um, yeah, Dani, please introduce the next round. Yeah, welcome back to the second part of the evening. We will now continue with the next round table, which raises an important yet heavily neglected part of the discussion on refugees in Europe, which is refugee crisis or system crisis, capitalism and migration. This panel will be moderated by Katerina Anastasiu. She, you know her already from the first part of tonight. She's a coordinator at Change for All, a transnational platform that maps and coordinates movements all across Europe. Please, Katerina, the stage is yours. Hello everyone again, uh, this time from the very nervous and hot seat of the moderator. Uh, this round is going to last again about 20 minutes 
Uh, I'm pretty sure you are also excited about the debate, uh, and I apologize in advance if all your questions are not going to be answered in one round. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the participants. Thank you very much for being here. Saskia Zassen, you can applaud in the middle if you want. <laughs> Professor at the Columbia University. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you have a new book coming up, Expulsions. Actually, it was published already, but it's going to be translated in German um, in the next months. Sandro Mesadra, I think, uh, author, activist. You can also applaud again. Yeah. And uh, of course, let's go forward again. Uh, <laughs> author and philosopher. So in this um, very short time, we will try to explore a little bit the relationships between capitalism and uh, migration or such. And I will start with Saskia. Uh, can you take the mic away? I would sit down. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what, uh, what would you say is there a connection between capitalism and migration? I mean, capitalism, the way it works, has to reproduce itself constantly. So uh, does actually capitalism benefit from migration or not? Because in, in the mainstream media right now in Europe, um, migration um, from re of refugees, but also from economical migrants, is being demonized, particularly in Europe right now, as something very bad, a threat that is about to breach the walls of yeah. fortresses. Mi uh, migrants have long been demonized. So when the Irish arrived in the United States, you know, and they were blondish and bluish eyes and all of that, they were totally racialized. So the demonizing, you know, is a very old story. Now, I, I think it's important to, to and, and I like your question. It's an important one, this connection between capital and capitalism and, uh, and migration. I mean, most countries and most areas of the world for a very long time had no emigration until quite recently recently, uh, emigration was not particularly widespread. There were particular regions where it was. But, and, and secondly, it's not that because people are poor, they migrate. That just doesn't hold. For centuries, and certainly for decades in our modernity, a lot of poor people, mostly they did not migrate. So your question is very apropos. There is something about a capitalist economy, but we can also go back to earlier forms of capitalism, like plantations, the big plantations. It demands a lot of labor. And certainly this was a time when you didn't have technologies replacing labor as it does now. So clearly, I think in my reading, it's a second point that is important to recover, is that, um, is that often the, the receiving countries, as we call them, built the bridges. So I am a critic of a lot of the migration literature. I hope I don't offend anybody in this room. I probably have offended 50% with that statement. But so, so we tend to study migration the moment the migrant leaves. Mm -hmm. But if you take that broader landscape that for the longest time there were actually only some countries sent migrants, then you have to ask, you know, what happened? And I often say we should actually start with the corporate boardrooms and the military apparatus of receiving countries. That doesn't cover everything, but it covers quite a bit. So that we want to complete that cycle. There is something about war, there is something about plantation economies, etc. Today there is something about mining, you know, that actually uh, demands an extraordinary amount of labor, exploitable labor, and that then becomes an incentive. Now, once the bridge is built, then there is a kind of autonomy that attaches to the migration. But we tend to forget that first step. The receiving countries often are the beginners. And certainly you have that in Germany, yeah? and in, I don't know about Austria, but certainly in Germany after World War II, they initiated. The, sec the third point, very important, for instance, Turkish migrants in Germany. Well, they are mostly actually minoritized. They are not your average Turkish person, you know. That, and so, so, you know, we discover these things gradually, but there is an ex extraordinary amount of generalizing about the migration question, which we should sort of really investigate. Huh? And, and so the Turks, they were, they were mostly 
Kurdish Turks, they were mountain people. And I remember when one of the, the heads of the, of the Kurdish people was taken prisoner, there were massive demonstrations in Germany, in Berlin, etc., because they were mostly Kurdish Turks. So the so same thing with Morocco, the Berbers. So there are these very specialized conditions that contribute to explain the migration process. And I think it's sort of worthwhile knowing a bit about it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laska. Thank you also for keeping the time. Well, uh, that, was, that yeah, was an accident. Was amazing, I didn't yeah. have to. <laughs> I had my coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let's go to you, Sandra. Um, so um, we're talking about, I mean, we meet today also, the theme of the event today is our duty to the refugees. And from an ethical point of view, but also from a political point of view, um, we need to provide these people with security, we need to provide them with uh, a life, they hope they were when they, when they start traveling, refugees and migrants again. Still, uh, since um, most of the causes um, of mass migration or people, the causes that um, as they push people to seek refuge in Europe, but also in other countries, are actually sourced in capitalism. And the question that I would have to you is, what limits do we have for human uh, migration policy within capitalism? Are there limitations there? And uh, how could we breach them, if they are? Well, it's again a, a, a very important question. Uh, we could even say that uh, uh, there is no capitalism uh, without uh, labor mobility <laughs> since the very inception of uh, uh, capitalism. <laughs> and mobility, labor mobility, <laughs> has always been a kind of field uh, of tension, a kind of field uh, of struggle under uh, capitalism. <laughs> If you look at the way in which uh, labor mobility, migration, internal migration, uh, international migration uh, has been uh, regulated, uh, you will find uh, that uh, in different historical ages, uh, there has uh, always been a whole set of limits uh, imposed upon uh, mobile uh, subjects. Uh, and nowadays, we are confronted uh, with uh, a situation uh, that uh, kind of joins uh, this long history of uh, contested mobility of labor uh, uh, under capitalism. You are right when you say that uh, uh, nowadays uh, migration, even economic migration, uh, is uh, kind of demonized uh, in Europe. But if you look uh, at the reports that are issued by uh, several ministries uh, of economy, <laughs> by several uh, corporate actors, by several think tanks in Europe, you will always find a statement, a very clear statement about the fact that uh, Europe needs migration. It needs migration from the point of view of uh, the stability of its uh, labor market, but also for uh, sheer demographic uh, reasons and for the sustainability of uh, welfare systems. And so we are confronted nowadays precisely with this kind of tension between uh, political rhetorics uh, which should demonize uh, migrants uh, and uh, a continuous uh, need uh, for uh, migration. Uh, and it is precisely this tension that produces the conditions for uh, the exploitation of uh, uh, migrant labor in uh, many parts uh, of Europe. I mean, and uh, it is quite easy to see that no big city in Europe could uh, work, could reproduce itself uh, without uh, you know, the contribution of a multitude of migrant workers. Thank you very much, Sandra, too. Also for keeping the time. Uh, Stratsko, you're up. It's a big, big challenge <laughs> to keep the time too. Um, my question to you would be um, the following. So, 
since the beginning of the summer, after the European spring, after the first months of euphoria and European solidarity, uh, not only the political uh, situation in Europe has changed, uh, but also the way um, media talk about what is happening right now um, and uh, at the borders of Europe. Meaning by that, all of a sudden we talk only numbers. Uh, the, whole, the whole deal, the whole European Union Turkey deal is about numbers. How many would you take? Uh, when Hungary and Poland with their very, very disturbing governments right now um, uh, want to counter out the deal, they say we don't take more than 900 and they have to be Christian. And people are reduced constantly in numbers. We live, live also in a, in, in a time where the UN seems weaker than ever in its mission. The um, treaties, the different treaties that have to do with human rights, starting with the Genf, the Geneva Convention, are being discarded from governments officially. Just to remind also the room, it was November where it was actually decided that um, the crossing between Greece and Macedonia is closed for everyone else except Iraqis, um, Afghans and Syrians, meaning practically that everybody else coming from other countries didn't have the right to seek refuge. So we live in these times and um, we, we can see the trend of um, dehumanizing migrants and refugees, uh, devaluing human life, giving a value. They, they, cost, they cost so much. You have Denmark uh, passing laws saying you have to confiscate their belongings in order to feed them. And from your point of view as a philosopher, how do you think do we counteract and what, is it actually capitalism self-destroying itself by posing this kind of uh, taboos in the society where dehumanizing people? Um, okay, you just took my two minutes. <laughs> uh, you're gonna get another two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I will take it back. Yeah, you're gonna take um, it back. So it, it's a very good question uh, because what you see with, with the refugee crisis is precisely the contradictions of, of capitalism today. Uh, namely, you mentioned that uh, some of the refugees, Iraqis, Afghanistan and so on, were not let in into the European Union according to the definition of uh, the, the difference between economic migrants and asylum seekers, which I think is the best embodiment of ideology today. Uh, why? Because I think there is no difference between economic migrants and asylum seekers because economic migrants are also victims of capitalism. People from Afghanistan Now you stole me half a minute. Don't please don't applaud. <laughs> no thanks. Uh, so I think it's it's part of the same problem. Uh, uh, and speaking about contradictions, I don't know if you read the news recently that. Uh, Recently, several months ago, in Syria, uh, one rebel group sponsored by Pentagon and another rebel group sponsored by the CIA are fighting each against each other. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the very curious case of uh, Berlin Gildo, uh, who is a Swedish citizen, uh, who was uh, uh, brought up in front of the cor court uh, under the accusation that uh, he was a rebel in Syria. Uh, but the whole case uh, fell down because they realized that the British intel intelligence was supporting the same terrorist group in which Berlin Gildo was taking part. So you can see capitalism is full of contradictions. Uh, to answer your question and to bring actually this discussion uh, to a geopolitical level because I think what we missed today uh, is precisely geopolitics. Um, I'm not so optimistic, thanks. <laughs> I, I'm not so optimistic uh, when it comes to solving the refugee crisis. You mentioned numbers. Yeah, we speak about numbers, we speak about quotas. Now we outsource the refugees uh, to a dictator in, 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 in Turkey. Then we import again. So what you have is actually export-import. First we export wars to Libya, to Syria, then we import refugees, and then again we export money to Erdogan, and then what? Then again we import the so-called democratic values to Germany, where you have someone like Bernemann, for instance, uh, who could end up uh, in front of the court. Uh, a leading member of the German Pirate Party ended up in prison because he was making fun out, out of Erdogan. So you see the contradictions. What is the problem? The problem is that the refugee crisis, if you ask me, but we are here to change it, cannot be solved. Uh, it cannot be solved because it's part of a bigger problem and it's part of a bigger geopolitical picture. The refugee crisis didn't start in Syria. It didn't start in Libya. 
It didn't start in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in all the forgotten wars. It started in the Pentagon. It started in the Pentagon, yes, in the State Department. <laughs> Just, just to finish, because it, I think it's very important to note, it will go on. Uh, recently, WikiLeaks uh, published uh, a secret document on the so-called Operation Sofia. I don't know how much you know about it, but you should Google it. Go to WikiLeaks and check it out. Uh, it's a military action in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, led by French forces, UK forces, Frontex, and so on, where the first step, so it consists of three parts. The first step is uh, military action in the high seas of the Mediterranean, in order, apparently, to stop the smugglers uh, bringing refugees in. The second step is, it's not high seas anymore, but they want to come, and they already are in the territorial waters of Libya. And now, when you read Operation Sofia, the secret uh, document, which is not secret, fortunately, anymore, thanks to WikiLeaks, you will see what is the next plan. You have an Italian commander saying, asking from the European authorities for an invasion of Libya uh, on the ground. And what is the reason? That's the reason, and here I end, why I think there is no difference between economic migrants and asylum seekers. The reason is economy again. So the situation in Libya is completely unstable. Why is it unstable? Of course, because of us again, because of France, Hollande, and so on, and the United States. And it's unstable, and what they need is actually a new intervention in Libya to bring, again, the economy back to Europe. So I think as, as long as we don't question geopolitics, what is happening in Syria, where you have more than 20 players involved, uh, we can solve the refugee crisis. And what it shows, and this is an announcement for the next round table as well, is a complete failure of foreign policy of, of European Union. Thank you very much. So um, we have another question. Uh, we're going to try a new method. We have to go back to normal <laughs> after this. This is tough. Yes. All right. No. What uh, What I would like. I mean, the situation is very depressive. Also, you, not, not only for us, not only for the people that are driven in front of the television, also for the the people of solidarity on the ground. They are uh, at the verge of burning out frequently. Yeah? So uh, let's take the last three, four minutes with all three of you uh, to imagine a little bit our situation in 20 years and how we're going to look back to the time we're living right now. And I pledge for some optimism, just in keywords. Would it be better or not for all, for all, all of you? No, yeah. Sandro, you start. You start. Then no, 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 I will take all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, I hadn't thought about that question that you asked. Because right now, when you look at the current situation, it does look pretty dismal, actually. And you mentioned disheartened, you didn't quite use that word, but something along that line. Also a kind of fatigue and... and well, I, I, I mean, there are many points of entry huh, to create a landscape that might allow me to answer your question. So one of them is our political classes. Our political classes are lazy. They don't do their homework. Wie sagt man das auf Deutsch, wissen Sie? Wenn die Studenten zurückkommen von, ja, die Arbeiter. What? Hausanwerber. Ja, Hausanwerber, also, no? And they should, <laughs> and they should do a bit of it. Eh? So, so, the easiest solution to the situation of politicians right now is to let this weird anti-immigrant fear, etc. just, you know, that uh, they don't have to do anything. Instead of explaining a bit of adding knowledge, etc., they enable, and we see that in the United States in an extreme form, because the United States is a bit simple besides brutal, and that is a very dangerous mix, I must say. So here, here is my take. My take is that one mode, and it's just one, one mode of beginning to contest that is to sort of transversalize, you know, there are many aspects that that different communities share. And you begin to see that in Europe a bit, right? And, and, and so that, that we begin to learn from each other and that we can push our political classes to, you know, to do a bit of harder work, et cetera, et cetera. And I can imagine, I can imagine, but so I have a bit of a negative view of what comes next, the next 20 years. I think capitalism is 
truly in an epoch of decline. Epochs of decline are often handled via the militarizing of solutions. You know, that's, it's not a good moment. Declining empires are brutal in a way that they're not when they are rising. The civilizational project disappears and it's power and fear and so so I think we must start working like after this conference is over like that's in a few hours <laughs> we should start mobilizing my clock <laughs> Cross communities, you know, look, I, I don't like the word community very much, but localities. We need to create mass. We need to create territories that are our territories and to cut across whatever, you know, the superstructure of national sovereign, the, the conventional geopolitics, we need to make a new geopolitics, literally geographies and politics. And that means really cutting across all kinds of stuff. Those who don't want to come with us, forget them. We move on, right? And the political classes, maybe they'll wake up, maybe there will be some brilliant ones. Uh, there always are, you know, some good politicians. And so something along those lines is what I see. But we have got to start working now. How's that? Are we ready? <laughs> well, I'm not particularly good uh, at uh, forecasting the future. Uh, uh, I prefer to look uh, at the present and I prefer to uh, urge us all to try to develop a different gaze on the present in order to unearth the potentialities of the present and to start building a different future. I mean, from the point of view of what is currently discussed as the refugee crisis, I think that we are confronted with a situation which is uh, full of such potentialities. We don't have to see only the kind of violence, the kind of dangers that are undoubtedly there. But in order to confront this violence, in order to confront these dangers, we have to look for the potentialities that are hidden in the present. And these potentialities are huge, both if you look at the stubbornness of movement of refugees and migrants. And if you look at the multiplicity of solidarity initiatives that you have everywhere in Europe. I mean, this is a kind of glimpse, you know, of uh, the future. And uh, the future that uh, we need uh, to construct is a future that uh, is, uh, of course, uh, predicated upon uh, these new geographies that uh, Saskia was evoking now. But part and parcel of these new geographies is also a different Europe, is also our ability to uh, conquer Europe as a political space for a new project under the sign of radical equality and radical freedom. I mean. uh, so, <clears throat> Sandro mentioned uh, the future and the present. I would like to start with the history uh, because Hegel said, Hegel once said, uh, if you learned anything out of history is that we didn't learn anything out of history. Uh, so let me give you just a very short story from in his book, uh, Developed von Gestern, described the, the beginning of the 20th century, two world wars, and took his life in Brazil later. Uh, these two stories are the following ones. Uh, first, it was summer 1914. Uh, <coughs> Stefan Zweig was having a vacation near Vienna, I think it's Baden or something like that, and he said it was the uh, more summer in German, uh, the summer was sommerlich than je. It was more summerish than ever, and people were, you know, uh, taking a bath, swimming in lakes and so on, and then the next month, boom, the First World War. 
And okay, this is still not the end. In his book, The Welt von Gestern, uh, Stefan Zweig describes very well, he was living in Salzburg then, and he says the following. So this is just before the breakout of the, of the Second World War. My house in Salzburg, Salzburg lay so close to the border that with the naked eye I could view the Berchtesgaden mountain on which Adolf Hitler's house stood. A very disturbing neighborhood. This proximity to the German border, however, gave me an opportunity to judge the threat to the Austrian situation and the national socialism that was way affect Austria. And I think precisely in Austria today we find ourselves in such a situation. Uh, so I cannot end up with optimism. I can only end with hope without optimism because I think this is what we need today. We have to get rid of the naive concept of optimism, but we need hope. And since we, since we are seen. We did it. Thank you very much. And we give back to Daniel. Yeah. Was ist der Grund? 
Thank you so much for this beautiful Sorry. and also disturbing song. I think those of you who understand German might have guessed the origin of the song. It's actually based on transcripts of interviews with asylum seekers done by the Austrian authorities. Yes. Sasha, do you want to maybe tell us a few sentences about the origin and of the song? Yeah, yeah uh, we did that song f uh uh, three and a half years ago. It was a part of a performance uh, we did for a festival here in Vienna, Wien Woche. And yeah, like you said, it was, it's based on, uh, on, on uh, some texts, uh, transcripts from, from the, you know, interrogations of, of, of uh, refugees. Yeah. Do you actually know the people who have been interviewed? Um, yeah, but, um, me personally, no. But there are some people in, 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 in the uh, chorus who have contacts to those people and who also uh, got these texts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on, before we go on, and uh, not only as Diem is uh, campaigning for transparency, and you might have read uh, when you bought your tickets or you entered the theater that we announced to um, donate uh, half of the entrance fee to initiatives um, helping refugees. And I just wanted to tell you to whom exactly we uh, thought of giving the money. Um, first of all, it's um, one part will go to the Schweigende Mehrheit. You just saw the performance at the beginning of the first part. <laughs> another part, another part um, shall go to an educational project working with refugees as um, young in Austria. It's called PROSA. Again, 
and again another one to the eight. Me. One part goes to the assistant Macedonia, an NGO that emerged during the recent crisis or the actually ongoing crisis. Yeah, these four um, <laughs> will be the recipients. Now let's go to the next round table, uh, moderated by Robert Miesig, um, a Vienna-based uh, journalist and political author. Um, uh, Robert, the stage is yours. Yes, the stage is not only mine, it's the stage of my three guests at this last panel. Uh, Katja Kipping, Walter Bayer and Yanis Varoufakis. If I, if I may, if I may say, uh, say, say that uh, three uh, comrades and friends since years and decades, <laughs> uh, um, very I'm fun. very glad to have all of you three here uh, at our evening panel, and I, I'm also very glad that we have you here. Uh, you, the not really audience, the, the, the people who share this evening with us and share these common feelings and this common um, energy we want to bring out of this room. Thank you everybody to be here. Uh, Katja Kipping um, is a member of the German parliament and head of the German party Die Linke. Uh, welcome Katja. Thank you. I'm glad that I can be here with all of you. Walter, Walter Bayer is the Austrian guy in this round. He is uh, from Vienna and he is uh, economist and coordinator of Transform Europe in Vienna. Thank you very much for inviting me. And, and Yanis Varoufakis is economist too. <laughs> and he is Guilty. He's former uh, uh, minister of finance from Greece. As, um, the issue of this last panel is Europe's failing uh, foreign policy and uh, we, we don't even know in which way European policy, foreign policy is, is failing because uh, at the beginning European foreign policy is the foreign policy of, uh, of the member states and the foreign policy of the member states was that everybody is making policy against the other member states. So w beginning with that, it's r relatively difficult to come to a, f to a practicable and humanitarian uh, European policy on the refugee issue as we saw in the last months. Um, uh, given that we also want to be in a way not op optimistic but looking for solutions, looking for our options and our, our possibilities. Uh, um, and I want to give the first uh, question to Katja. Uh, if we would think to a practicable and humanitarian solution for this challenge, uh, which has for sure a lot of uh, problems to handle, open the borders for the people, but also supporting uh, countries like Lebanon, Jordania, uh, Turkey, as you mentioned, the countries which have really a refugee crisis. What would you say, what would be a, a progressive policy, policy mix uh, to, to tackle this situation? Well, a good start would be um, refrain from doing the wrong things because uh, European foreign policy is characterized by doing the opposite of what could be a solution and refraining from doing the wrong things such as dirty deals with dictators like Erdogan could be a good start or no more export of weapons and arms, so stop um, arms. And unless we don't all over Europe accept that the right to asylum is a human right and it's not about granting mercy, we won't find the first, we won't be able to do the first step to a progressive uh, European foreign policy. And speaking about, um, for example, the Middle East or for example about Syria, 
I just can say that military intervention are definitely no solution for it. And let me point out one thing clearly. I don't know whether anybody will be able to find a proper solution for Syria, but I'm convinced without the Kurdish people, there won't be a democratic solution for this country. And the fact that the peace conference about Syria, from this conference, the Kurdish forces will be excluded, underlines that right now European foreign policy is led by the wrong ideas and by wrong people, of course. The refugee questions underlines the necessity of transnational cooperation. So those who are in favor of a withdrawal into the national cocoon are clearly wrong because the big uh, question of humanity can be solved only within the national cocoon. Um, but um, the question is not whether we do need more or less EU. I would see we do need a definitely totally different EU. This Europe does need a fresh start. And regarding the refugee question, we do need a pan european taking in refugees. And if you now would ask me, okay, how can we convince those member states who are under a right-wing government, for example, or under just a conservative or neoliberal government, I would say, okay, I propose a special financial support for those countries' origins who are taking in more refugees than they are responsible. And this could be financed. The European um, um, level just has to take a bond a European bond, and this should be used for housings as well as for refugees and for people with a just low income. We do need a European bond, and this could be refined by a European-wide uh, taxing of uh, millionaires. So um, I am convinced <laughs> without, without the old left uh, claim for redistribution, we won't be able to find a proper solution for those questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Katja. Uh, I want to, to, to ask my next question to, uh, to Walter. Also because we are now in Austria in a very difficult, let's say, let's put it uh, in a frankly, in a very tense and maybe the most dangerous situation, uh, maybe since years. Uh, how do you think that we in Austria can uh, bring forward the solution to, to the challenges we are, the, the, the Austrian left uh, is, uh, is now? How, how can we come out of this dead end? Well, let me start by uh, quoting uh, a saying by uh, Bruno Kreisky, uh, Lernen Sie Geschichte, learn history. And from this point of view, the refugee issue is quite close to me, because here in Vienna, we had before 1938, uh, a Jewish community of 170,000 people. And after the war, we had only 10,000. And 50,000 of them were killed and exterminated in the camps. But 120,000 of them could escape. And what they found when they escaped, closed borders, prison camps in the UK, in France, in Switzerland. You may know the story of uh, Josef Schmidt, a world famous tenor, who ended up in uh, a prison camp in Switzerland. And when, after an international campaign, he was released, he lived only for three days because he fell ill in this camp and simply died. So I would say, first of all, that people Ordinary people must understand that there is a moral duty to open the border and to receive people and to treat them humanistically and friendly and welcomingly. <laughs> and now to your question in particular. Uh, during the debate, um, one 
comrade said, uh, what did change after the summer of solidarity? And I would say changed because the same people who help the refugees are still there and doing the same things. The only thing which actually has changed is the attitude of the government, the coalition parties and the big media. And that leads to a change in the population because people who formerly did not dare to speak out against the refugees now they are to do so. And they occupy public spaces, they go to assemblies, they uh, gather in front of uh, refugee uh, sites and refugee homes, and they make noise. And this has changed, and this is the responsibility of politics, of political parties, and of mass media. And we must cope and we must oppose this. And <laughs> Let me say one open word as a member of the Austrian Trade Union Federation. It is scandalous that the chairperson of the Austrian Trade Union Confederation raises his voice in favor of the coalitions with the Freiheitliche Partei. And it is not only scandalous, it is crazy. It is crazy right is the outspoken enemy of the labor movement of labor rights and of the trade unions and for this reason for this reason the ÖGB has in its statute i think it's paragraph 3 stated the ÖGB opposes any kind of right radicalism any kind of racism and any effort to take away democratic rights of the people and they must apply to this statute. Only this thing. And the last sentence which I want to say in this, uh, in this context is, well, there is what to do. There is, of course, an easy answer. The popular answer is they stay together, talk to people, do good things. I'm afraid the answer is more complicated than this. I believe that we must recuperate politics meaning we must not leave politics to those parties who have created the mess in which we are in. Yes, thank you. I think I can't earn more applause than this. Thank you very much. <laughs> we hope for the time where you don't get applause for that. Yeah? That would be a great time. Um, uh, Janis, uh, I want to touch a little bit another an, another field or uh, interconnected field, if if you allow. Um, how is the social crisis and the humanitarian crisis we are now facing, which means the, uh, the negative attitude to refugees interconnected? Uh, because uh, also in the question of foreign policy, we have this, this European disaster that every country is working against the other country. We had it first uh, at the question of the financial crisis. Now we have it again with dealing with, the, with this humanitarian challenge. On the other hand, uh, we can only solve this humanitarian uh, challenge if we, if we leave austeritarian uh, austerity policy, uh, politics. Am I right with that? Or, uh, what would you say to that? You're absolutely right. Uh, the disintegration of the core of the European Union, which is due to the economic crisis, which was inevitable given the way we constructed the European Union, and in particular the common currency, is turning a sequence of three words into a joke. Put together the words European foreign policy, and you end up with a joke. <laughs> yeah? But before I come back to the relationship between the economic crisis and the joke that is European foreign policy, let me say that it is absolutely impossible to have a coherent, let alone humanistic, European foreign policy as long as Europe is under the or within the black cloud of NATO. 
It is really very simple. <laughs> Speaking to what Sretsko Horvat was saying before about the geopolitics, we will not be able to solve the geopolitical equation that leads to refugees uh, streaming all over the world if we maintain the Cold War alliance with the United States that is firstly, besides the point now, the Cold War is finished and we have the relic of the Cold War, which is trying to find, constantly to find, reasons for perpetuating its existence. <laughs> and at this point, I want to draw everyone's attention to a delicious paradox. A terrible paradox, but it would be delicious if it was not so toxic. It is this. Let me take you back to 2015 when our government was elected to oppose the Troika of lenders, to oppose austerity, to reboot Europe by ending the toxic bailouts, the extend and pretend loans which were coming to us, to the whole periphery of Europe, attached with austerian strings that furthered the deflation and in the end came back to Austria and to Germany in the form of negative interest rates that, as Volkan Schäuble correctly said, is inflaming the forces of reaction of the IFD, of uh, ultranationalism and so on and so forth. During that period, what was the position of the United States of America? What was the position of the administration? When we were elected, let me remind you, President Obama came out with a very good statement. He said, I don't know whether this is verbatim, but the essence of what he said was that the principle of the greatest austerity for the most bankrupt nation, he meant Greece, needs to be rethought. Well, that's what we were saying. Yeah? So what did Europe respond to that? Get off our territory. We are not going to be lectured by the United States of America. Which is, you yeah, know, just hold this for a moment. But when it comes to foreign policy, it's NATO. And it's whatever the United States administration says, except that the United States administration is confused in the, uh, and, and they are fighting each other. So the State Department has a different policy in the Ukraine than uh, the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon has a different policy to the CIA. Um, you have the same. Um, countries sponsoring different terrorist organizations, different resistance groups, and different political forces throughout the world. Yeah? So the only conflict is between different agencies of the United States. Europe is waiting for the line, the party line, as if we were you know, in a communist party. Uh, and the, the Washington line, once Washington decides what it is, is simply regurgitated, recapitulated, repeated. So compare and contrast. We have a unique capacity in Europe to import only the bad things from America. So the New Deal, the idea that austerity must end in the periphery of Europe, is rejected with contempt by Europeans wishing to insert their own independence from the United States. Huh? The good things are rejected. All the terrible things that come from the United States, immediately we lap them up. And I think that in this paradox you understand the um, how advanced a stage of disintegration we labor under here in Europe. We have, we have now uh, two minutes and 25 seconds, uh, maybe some seconds more. Um, le so let's come to a, to a last round uh, where we should really uh, talk about how, what, what kind of difference we can make. Because it doesn't, make, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say, okay, the government of Germany, the government of France, the government, of, they are all bullshit. They are all, uh, they, 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 uh, they, don't, they don't know anything. And if they do something, they do the wrong thing. Uh, we know that. Uh, but what can we do? Uh, what can DM do? What, what should DM be? Uh, how is there, or put it in the question of our panel, is there a, Pressure for other for another European foreign policy possible. Uh, a pressure by the people, by the citizens of Europe, by uh, by. 
by us who are in a, in a kind of discontent with this policy? What, what would you say? I think the question to all of you three, maybe, yeah. Well, um, first of all, I share uh, Yanis' passion about NATO, the dark cloud uh, over Europe. Uh, but let me say, here in Austria, <laughs> we are not member of NATO. We still are a neutral country. And by the way, this neutrality of Austria was recognized in the Lisbon Treaty. So it is not so that there is a complete congruency between NATO uh, and the European Union. And I think and I believe that the Austrian left should stick with defending the idea of neutrality, which, which is not the idea of isolating existing in a large sea of violence, but which is the idea of demil demilitarization of foreign relations, of creating spaces of cooperation, of uh, being welcoming. I mean that 150,000 Hungarian refugees after the revolution could come to Austria, that approximately 50,000 Jewish citizens of the Soviet Union could go through Austria and then to Israel. This has to do, firstly, with the particular international status of being a neutral country, and secondly, with the wise policy, which at that time was applied by Bruno Kreisky and Rudolf Kirchschläger and other people here in the country. And I think we should stick to this tradition. And finally, um, the issue of optimism and pessimism. There is this wonderful quotation of Gramsci. You ought to be pessimistic when it comes to analysis and you ought to be optimistic when it comes to election. What justifies pessimism is the very fact that we are living in a country where maybe, hopefully not, but maybe, we are going to have a president who says culturally, linguistically, historically, this country belongs to Germany. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine a, a, a Greek president saying uh, our country belongs to, uh, I don't know to which country you could belong. Could Russia? You imagine a president of the United States saying because we are, the most of us are speaking English, we belong to the United Kingdom. This is absurd. And the possibility that such a thing happens is definitely not a reason to be optimistic. <laughs> but there are reasons to be optimistic uh, because we need reinventing the left, but that must be a broad left and it must be going beyond party borders and uh, it must go beyond philosophical borders. Uh, I mean, the, take the Catholic Church as an example, I have in my mind the picture when Pope Francis took 12 refugees from Lesbos and uh, Syrian refugees, Muslim refugees, and brought them to Rome. If the Pope was an Austrian citizen, he would be dubbed as a good man, and <laughs> most probably he would sued for human trafficking. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, actually, there are things possible. Maybe at the crossroads as we are, we have the possibility to create something new, to create a new Austrian left, to make an Aufbruch, a departure. And if this happened, maybe the rules of the game could change. And that's why, finally, I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> there is no guarantee that at the end of the day we will make the difference, but I think we have the obligation to try it. Um, and just one concrete suggestion. 
Um, right now, we can see that with the TTIP, a massive attack against democracy is planned. And the good message is we still can stop it. And I think it's our obligation to put pressure on every government who wants to ratificate uh, this um, attack um, against democracy. And, um, you know, this um, treaty will influence all our lives. So I would say it's the right of the all people living in Europe to have a referendum about this, and we um, would, of course, um, vote um, against this um, treaty. And I um, would say, if the government is not allowing us such a referendum, we should take um, it in our own hands and say, okay, then let's have a wild referendum because it's our continent. And one tactic remark, I suggest we should concentrate our protests on the social democracy. Because for Germany, I know it for sure from the surveys, 70% um, of the um, social democrats are against the TTIP. Unfortunately, the leader, the president of the social democrats is in favor of the TTIP. So um, we have to concentrate our protest on them because they are the weakest um, target and they have to be turned in this uh, question. And let me, uh, well, Speaking about the refugee question in the media and in the uh, talk shows, there are always uh, this um, word problems appears. The problems or potential problematic developments. So I'd like to add an optimistic note. Generations have been raised in the idea of post-politics. Politics was something considered to be more or less boring and, you know, you could decide this way or this way, it doesn't make any difference. And now with the refugee question, we have a question where people in all generations are asked to take sides. And when everybody in the media is speaking about rising right-wing populism, let's not forget that now there's a new generation who is passionately taking sides for solidarity. And I think there is hope. And if in these days there is still hope in Europe, it's not the achievement of the EU elites. It's the achievement of the volunteers and the activists and the pan-European networks for solidarity. And this is something we can go on with and let's say clear this continent belongs to us, it belongs to the many, and we don't leave it to the EU elites. Thank you. We need to overcome an illusion. There is this illusion, the specter of the illusion in Europe. That there is a tension between democratizing the European Union or democratizing and democratizing the nation state, the region, the municipality, the city. At the moment, your parliament in Austria has very little power because of the lack of democracy in Brussels. It is a mistake to think that you can democratize Austria better by moving away or allowing the process of disintegration of the European Union to continue. The reinvigoration of democracy in your locality, in your nation, passes through the democratization of European Union institutions. European Union institutions do not want to be democratized. They will fight tooth and nail. They have a deep, deep contempt for democratic process for the Austrian people, the German people, the Greek people. They are like a cartel. We need to confront them, to democratize the European Union in order to give more degrees of freedom, more sovereignty to our parliaments and to our city halls. This is the challenge for Europe. And to do this, we need a pan-European movement. This is why we set up the Democracy in Europe movement, not because we are somehow Europeanists who believe that the nation state is finished, but because we are Europeanists who believe that the only way of empowering the nation state, of empowering local governments, of empowering communities, of empowering human beings, of allowing individuals to be citizens, citizens rather than no man's land, 
wandering atoms. We must confront the deep anti-democratic streak in Frankfurt, in Brussels, but also in Vienna, in London, in Berlin, in Athens, and in Madrid. So let me finish on a very practical note. Go to dm25.org and become members. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Yanis. Thank you, all of you. Uh, maybe, maybe some some words from my side. I think it's it's very important uh, that we, as people from and citizens from Europe, come together meet regularly, that's the first thing which started with DiEM25, uh, and it's a, it's a huge step that we know each other, that we know each other better, uh, that we start organizing, and what we saw in this last autumn in Austria and in Germany, that there are millions and hundred thousand and millions of people who want to get active, but who don't know on which point they can act together. Uh, and if we s make it possible, these people to to act together, then we are, as a great Austrian said, uh, then we are unstoppable. Thank you very much. Thank you for this amazing panel, the closing panel. You don't have to leave now, it's we finish in 10 minutes. Um, but as we're slowly coming to an end of tonight, um, of course there needs to be a small commercial break. Um, so I'm happy to point out that this event is accompanied by a fantastic brochure called Spectre Europe. You can buy it outside at the entrance if you're interested. It's edited by Lukas and Hanna Wallenfels, and it does not only contain pieces of Sreczko and Janis, but the famous essay We Refugees by Hanna Arendt, and also pieces of the two philosophers Jean-Luc Nancy and Rossi Predotti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that one. Um, so, yeah, uh, we are really coming to an end by now. You won't believe it, right? Um, after the last song, um, you will, have co of course, have the opportunity uh, to get another drink outside and to <laughs> grab some food. And uh, we will also have a DJ here. So you are really warmly invited to stay with us and to celebrate with us. Um, at this point, let me also thank for the fabulous catering from the Migrating Kitchen, who did all our catering tonight. <laughs> As we not, we not only loved their food, but we loved also their slogan, where art and activism meet labor and politics, and this was really matching um, to this event. So. Now we come definitely to the end with the last song, which is a very special and a very famous one. It was written by a legend of um, German punk music, and it delivered both the slogan and the soundtrack for an entire generation of protesters. And yet it, is, it appears to meet our situation today, today as well. So. Um, Yes, it's the last song by Rohr, 29 November, but you might know it from Rio Reiser and Die Tonsteine Scherben. <laughs> Destroy that what destroys you, or in German, macht kaputt, was euch kaputt macht. Thank you all Good very night. much. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Stay with us, and now, stage three for the last song. Thanks. Hmm? <laughs>
Dankeschön. Chor 29. November. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank. Wer mitsingen will, wer T-Shirts kaufen will, wer CDs kaufen will, kann uns ansprechen gerne. Dankeschön. Und das ist And as I said, uh, stay with us, celebrate with us, bars are open, or the bars actually are open. Um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us tonight. <laughs>